All right, so I'll just dig in. Um, hey, it's Patrick Carver with the Optimized Law Firm Podcast. Thank you for joining us and um, want to welcome you to another episode. We like to provide law firms with actionable tips on how they can run a more profitable and enjoyable business. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about one of the most important topics when it comes to growing your firm, the intake process. By improving the process, law firms can increase their conversion rate and the ROI that they're getting from marketing while also improving customer satisfaction. In this podcast, we only host illustrious guests, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Joseph Scrifano. Joe is a client and a premier criminal attorney in the D.C. area who has been consistently recognized by his colleagues and clients in outlets like Super Lawyers, Avo, and more. Additionally, he is the driving force behind a very successful four-attorney firm in, and has been consistently growing that uh, to really become a, a force in the, the D.C. area. So welcome, and thank you so much for taking some time to, to chat and take with me. Yeah, uh, Patrick, thanks for having me. You said illustrious lawyer. I, I was looking around trying to see if... Uh, who you were talking about. And then a, a second correction, we're actually up to six lawyers um, now. So we have two awesome. in Maryland and uh, four in the DC office. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm glad to talk to you. Intake is a uh, topic that is near and dear to my heart. So I'm, I'm glad to share whatever um, whatever knowledge I can for your guests. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate it. Um, first question I have, how did you get the name Scruff Justice? <laughs> um, so when I first started practicing, uh, I did indigent defense and I was on something called the Criminal Justice Act panel. And I, I did it uh, around 2010 when um, the legal market was still in shambles from the 2008 collapse. And so I didn't have a lot of experience when I started. I did, I'd done a clerkship in D.C. Superior Court. And so the way I um, overcompensated for my lack of experience was to just overwork every single case possible. Like I was trying... Uh, I was setting cases for trial that was like driving with a suspended license, doing uh, doing trials on possession of open container of alcohol. And I sort of developed a very aggressive style of, of criminal defense um, that kind of worked for me, which was to be, frankly, like the biggest pain in the ass you could possibly be to a prosecutor in the hopes that they will either give you, you know, a deal that your client could live with and was kind of fair in the situation or that they might make some mistake um, in the in the process, and you'd be able to get it dismissed or or ultimately um, go to trial. So I did some uh, more. Uh, I did some pretty aggressive things when I was um, first starting out. I filed a motion for contempt against a, a prosecutor because I it, it appeared in my view they were disobeying a court order. Um, I subpoenaed a prosecutor um, at another point in time when I thought he had made himself a witness in the case. Um, and when I got my first office space, I was in this. Um, building across the street from DC Superior Court, where there are a lot of older, more experienced lawyers in the building. And so they kind of took to calling me scruff justice. Um, you know, I like to think that it was uh, in an endearing way, although it could have been uh, kind of making fun of me. But, you know, I, I embraced it and, you know, kind of went with it. So, well, it seems to have been uh, very useful in the development of your firm and in your uh, ability to, to get results for clients. So tell us about how your practice has grown since you started from from being scruff justice and solo kind of figuring it out. Yeah, sure. So I, um, you know, I did uh, indigent defense for a number of years. And during that time, I, I was really focused on professional development. I didn't do any marketing. Um, I was try like I said, I was trying to try as many cases as possible and get as much experience as possible. I also didn't really feel comfortable marketing at that time based on my lack of experience because it's like okay pay me a bunch of money i've never tried a case before um, after a few years um, of, of trying cases and, and litigating a couple hundred cases in superior court and doing i did the trial lawyers college in wyoming which is like a three-week um, program with criminal defense lawyers and plaintiff lawyers across the country i started uh, started marketing i started the first thing i had was a blog website you know this is like 2013 2014 and i would i would think about what what kind of questions would my target client have um, and want to know and what would they be googling you know if i was like if i was arrested for a dui what are the kind of questions that i would have that i would i would google and i would try to write these 
uh, informative blog posts to speak to to those answers. And it was uh, pretty successful. I started getting um, a good amount of private business uh, from that. Um, ultimately, um, I gave up um, the indigent defense. Um, I got off the CJA panel. Um, and then in 2016, um, where I had some real explosive growth was two other um, solar practitioners joined my firm and um, kind of wrapped their practice into Scrofano Law. And, um, you know, we that I think from 15 to 16, we basically, basically like tripled or, or quadrupled the gross revenue um, of the firm and um, really was able to focus a lot more on marketing. Um, now that I, you know, was able to hire an, like an admin person and had other lawyers in the firm um, who were also, you know, generating revenue and working the cases. And so things kind of went, um, you know, from there sort of started, you know, started with blogging, building up a, a, my kind of my own private practice, independent from the court appointed stuff, and then um, really, you know, getting some, you know, really effective, good criminal defense lawyers who joined the firm um, and, and kind of having strength in numbers in that way. And, you know, we, we ultimately ended up um, in 2020 hiring um, an attorney to kind of open up our Maryland practice. Um, and then we've hired um, two associates in the last year and a half, one for Maryland, one for DC. So that's great. Yeah. Can you give us a kind of baseline definition of what goes into the in intake process or, or how, how you would summarize it? Sure. So intake is, 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 is first and foremost assessing whether a lead that comes in is qualified or not. You know, most small law firms and, and probably a lot of folks in your audience, you know, do a lot of SEO, do Google AdWords. So you're getting you're going to end up getting a lot of calls from the Internet. And so the first thing the intake process has to do is weed through and make sure, OK, is this person calling someone we can help? Is this person someone is this person calling someone who we can help and is in the right geography? You know, if somebody calls my firm and says, hey, I need a family lawyer. Um, then, you know, it's not a qualified lead. It's intake's responsibility to kind of weed them out. If someone calls and says, I need a criminal defense lawyer in Florida. Obviously, that's not a, a qualified lead either. Um, the, the second component is getting the actual qualified leads scheduled for consultation for the right attorney um, and then following up through the process. Um, and what we call in my firm and a, a lot of firms call who use like Clio Grow and stuff like that, we call it the pipeline. So it's like getting the right qualified leads into the pipeline um, um, uh, tracking them throughout the process and hoping to increase the likelihood that the firm will convert um, the clients in the end. Perfect. And why do you feel like this is such an important part of your day-to-day -day operations and running a successful law firm? Sure. So, I mean, I can tell you um, in, in 2017, we hired what we call a client intake specialist. And this is a person whose sole job is dedicated to chasing leads throughout the pipeline. Um, and so, you know, one of the biggest advantages of having someone who's dedicated to managing the pipeline, chasing leads, getting consults scheduled, making sure they show up, is that you can get a lot more bang for your buck in the marketing dollars that you spend. So if you, if, if let's say you're converting 10% of all qualified leads that come in, if you get 100 qualified leads, you're going to get 10 new clients. Well, there's only a couple of different ways you can, you can increase the amount of clients that you actually convert. You could get more leads. So let's say now you got 200 leads. So you got, you know, 20 clients the next month. Well, you're probably going to have to spend money in marketing uh, to get that extra hundred leads in order to double your clients, right? Well, if instead of getting more leads, you're able to double your conversion rate and, and instead convert 20% of the 100 leads, you, you can actually double the number of cases you're bringing in in a month or increase the number of cases you're bringing in a month without having to spend additional marketing dollars. And so your marketing ROI is going to be much higher if you have a, if you have good systems in place in the intake process. It's absolutely true and something that we probably don't talk about enough as a, a marketing agency is trying to help with, with some of that process because we can get you a million leads, right? But if if you're not following up with them, you don't have that a process in place, you're essentially throwing money down, you know, down the tube. And, and we've lost clients, right? Because we've, you know, we're we're providing high quality leads and they simply don't have the the system or 
uh, processes in place to actually take advantage of them. And so at the end of the day, it's, well, you're not getting us any, any revenue. And um, so I, you know, wanted to have you on in particular, because I know this is a, a really important issue for, you know, for your firm and I can, I can see it working, um, yeah. you know, with, with what we're sending over. Yeah. I mean, it's a great point. And, you know, I, when I, when I first started digging into this issue, I think I read one of these, um, it was like one of the Clio annual reports that they put out or something like that. And I think it was, I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this, but it was something like crazy, like the average small law firm converts like 10, per, like, like 15% of all qualified leads that come in, you know, and those are just, you know, that's just a staggering low numbers, right? Again, if you are, if you're converting 15% and you get a hundred leads, that's 15 clients, you know, um, my firm, we convert on average, um, 35 to 45% of leads that come in to actual, um, clients that we convert. So if we have a hundred qualified leads come in, we're going to have anywhere from, um, 35 to 45 new clients based on that. And what I think one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of law firms make is they have the attorney or one of the attorneys handling mm -hmm. the phone calls, right? Um, this was one of the first things I sort of learned about um, when I was digging into this issue is like, do not have lawyers answer the phone and be responsible for the follow-up for a potential lead that comes in. And since I had been a solo um, practitioner in my early years when I first started, it, it totally resonated with me because I used to, it, it, you know, at the very beginning, I had a I had a personal cell phone and a work cell phone, and that was like my whole system. So anybody at any time could call me off the internet; it would go directly to me. And well, somebody might call while I'm in court, you know, and I would get the message, and I would tell myself, okay, I'm going to call this back. This is a DUI lead. But then I would be getting out of court, and another client would call, and I'd be jumping on some other emergency, and I'd have a million other things to do. And then by the time I got back to calling you know, the person had already hired a lawyer, or I may have never got back to calling the individual. And I think that's, that's what happens um, when a, a, a solo or even a law firm that has multiple attorneys, when they're having the attorneys do the intake process and be responsible for these, for these leads, they are losing a ton of leads. And I know um, for a fact, because I lived through it, you know, and I, and I saw the drastic difference um, that it made once first I had someone like a non-attorney answering the phone um, and then ultimately had someone who entire position in the law firm is dedicated to intake, managing the pipeline, um, getting consultations scheduled, making sure the consults show up, following up with them after the attorneys um, do the consultation and just generally tracking all this stuff. Yeah, there's two points in there that I think are really important. The first is that if you can increase your conversion rate just a little bit, it makes all of your other numbers works so much better together. Your cost per acquisition for a new client goes down substantially. Your profitability goes up. Um, you know, you then get into this mode, I think, too, where you can start to be more selective as well, because you're generating more demand on the same number of, of leads, basically. And so you can start to raise your prices a little bit. You can start to be more picky with your cases. Uh, the other aspect, I think, of that is I think a lot of attorneys have maybe uh, a perception that they need to be on the phone converting those people, or maybe they, it may be also be, I think there's a reluctance there that it's just hard to train people as well in general. Uh, and so I think there's certain firms that, that kind of steer away from adding people to their team because they've had a bad experience or things like that. And I mean, it's absolutely going to happen where you're, you're going to find somebody who's not, not a great fit, but I think what you've probably seen is that once you find that person, it just makes such a world of difference when their only goal is, and they're motivated probably financially around chasing those people down, talking to them, converting them, because as an attorney, I mean, like you said, even if you were the most punctual on, on top of it type of person, you have physical blocks in your calendar where you cannot return a call, you know, because you're, you're in court and I think I'm guessing that you felt this during the progression of your firm since you started that now there's much more urgency around contacting, getting back to those people as soon as possible, because there's no shortage of choices. Costs for advertising in the criminal space have continuously gone up. So people are more aggressively courting that new business. 
you can't wait a day um, to get back to those people. Um, and I think that's a real advantage of, of having a system like the way you've got it set up. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've hit on a lot of a lot of key points and and have a lot of valuable insight there. Um, a couple things, you know, um, one, if you're not answering the phone, I mean, it's not just on the business side of things, right? It's also on the practice side of things. If you're answering phone calls all day, you're not doing good legal work for your clients. You know, if you're working on a motion and you're just allowing your phone to ring and answer that you're, you're getting distracted. You're not doing, you're basically not doing two things. Well, you're not doing intake well, and you're not doing your legal work. Well, the other thing you mentioned, um, you know, sometimes people have had bad experiences training. I think also sometimes, and I know this because I lived it, lawyers are afraid somewhat to invest in their business. They think about, okay, if I hire this, you know, receptionist or this client intake person, it's going to cost, you know, this much in salary and benefits, et cetera. And what I, what I think is, 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 you know, we're a good case study for is it absolutely more than pays for itself because you're again, you're converting more clients, you're doing better legal work for your existing clients because this is a whole kind of this is a whole piece of the firm that's more or less off your plate that you that you really just need to kind of supervise as opposed to actually work in. And you're also going to get more value for the money that you're spending on marketing services, right? So if you're, you know, doing Google ad campaigns or you're spending thousands of dollars a month on organic SEO and whatnot, why not have a system in place to be able to capture as much of that that comes your way? Because if you're not, you're basically leaving money on the table and you're letting your, comp- and, and there's people out there that you can help that your firm is not helping, that you're leaving to another firm or one of your competitors um, to hit. So, I mean, having, again, having having a good intake process Um, more than pays for itself. It's worth the investment. It's worth the investment in terms of quality of life. It's worth the investment in terms of, Mm -hmm. um, you know, get doing better legal work for your clients. It's worth the investment in getting more, you know, like I said before, more bang for your buck in the marketing dollars um, that you are spending. So hiring a person, it's obviously a great investment. Um, What other things would you incorporate in kind of an ideal intake system? Like what, what else is is what does that process look like for you sure. guys and you know what would you feel like is the, the kind of the best way to do it um across sure. a, a variety of law firms sure so you know number one you need you, you you need to you need to measure what you're doing right there's a saying we pay attention to what we measure so if your phone's ringing all the time and you're just kind of going off of oh i feel like the phone's ringing a lot or i feel like the phone's not ringing a lot you really don't know you're really not in a position to make the decisions about your business and about your firm and about your processes. So the first thing you need to start doing, you know, when you get someone in the position is have them start tracking what's coming in. Right. And there are a lot of different um, software systems that allow you to do that. When I first started, you know, and had someone answering the phone um, who was a non-attorney, but, but it was kind of like a, you know, office manager type who was basically an admin who was doing all of our admin stuff for us. Um, We would have her like, write in a Google sheet, every call that came in, was it a qualified lead? What was the nature of the call name first, you know, last name, et cetera. And then at least we had some mechanism, although it was tedious and and manual that we would go in and count and say, okay, you know, we're getting, you know, 25 qualified leads a month on average or or whatever it is. And there's some, you know, measurement and accountability for what's happening with the calls. Um, What was a real game changer for us was in 2017, we started using um, what was then called Lexicata. It's now Clio Grow, Clio um, bought it. And so, and there's that, there's other systems, I think my case and some of these others that do this type of stuff as well, but it basically gives you like a software system to track what's coming in. Right. So, um, you know, and and it's, it's nice because it kind of divides up the pipeline into the most important um, sort of areas. So the first one is what we call like the catch the lead. Right. So, you know, somebody could call your firm and maybe the call gets missed or somebody could, you know, do a a chat on your website or a direct contact form. And then when your client intake goes to call them, they don't answer the phone. Right. Well, okay. well, you know, they just sent this message. I don't know why they didn't answer the phone. Well, let's just forget about this. Or um, do we put it into some type of software system and then have a system in place to continue to follow up with that potential lead to try to get them scheduled? Right. So in Clio Grow, we've got the first, you know, kind of column. It's a lead column. And the object, the objective of that is to get them into the next column of the pipeline, which is called, you know, consult schedule, right? 
So understanding that at each level in the pipeline, there's a particular objective is important. So, okay, when a lead comes in, the objective there is to get that scheduled. Well, then in that consult scheduled pipeline, we then have a series of checks and touches to make sure that that person actually shows up you know, sending them a confirmation email. In our confirmation email, we've got information about the attorney um, that they're going to be speaking with, maybe a snippet from a review that a previous client left on Google. If it's an in-person consultation, we've got a Google map embed of where our office is and a picture of the front door of our office to try to take away every possible reason that they might no-show, you know, and then um, the next stage in the pipeline is the consult is the consult held, right? So once they're in consult scheduled, the objective is to get them into the consult held column. Um, and then once the attorney does the consultation, there's a kind of a series of steps um, in there. And then the client intake person will send them a retainer. And that's our, our kind of final stage of the pipeline, which is retainer sent. And then there's a series of follow-ups after that, because, you know, especially in criminal um, when you're, you know, you're dealing with individuals that may have to get large amounts of money together, they're, they're, a lot of times they're not just in the console going to go, okay, run my card, I'm ready to start. A lot of times they need right. to think about it. A lot of times they might need to talk to a spouse, talk to another stakeholder in their life about the decision. They may be consulting um, with other attorneys. And so once they're in that retainer sent, we have a series of steps to follow up with them to find out if there's any more questions we can um, answer for them, if they have any questions about the retainer agreement, about a payment plan, um, et cetera. So um, all of that to say, you know, the, the most important steps are one, tracking, you know, making sure you're not losing track of any of these leads because at every level of the pipeline, you could lose them. You know, mm -hmm. you could lose them before you schedule the consult. You could lose them by them not showing up. You could lose them by forgetting to follow up with them after the consult is held and the retainer is sent. Um, two, you know, having a good software system that you can, you know, track this stuff so that you're not, you know, having somebody do it manually. Um, and then three, having, uh, having standards, like we have standards in our office that says, okay, um, your objective as a client intake specialist is you, you have to maintain an 80% capture the lead rate. That means you're expected to, if we get 10 leads come in, you're expected at a minimum to get eight of those scheduled for a consultation. And if you, and we also have an, a, a standard of 80% show up rates. So out of those 80% that we got scheduled, it's your responsibility to make sure that 80% of those people actually show up for the consultation. Now, after that, you know, there's a little bit more, you know, it's, it's after that, it's a little bit more on the attorney to do the conversion because they're the one holds it, holding the consultation, et cetera. But that at least gives, you know, some kind of key performance indicator to give your mm -hmm. client and in, intake person to be striving to um, and trying to meet so that you can keep your um, conversion numbers up. You've laid out a ton of really <laughs> useful. No, it's great. I mean, I, I love it. Uh, all of that goes into it. And I think I just want to point out, though, that I think this is probably the collection of years of, of oh, yeah. trial and error, right? And so if you, you know, if you're an attorney and you, you, you've never done anything like this, right? Um, I think there's, there are ways that you could probably start and not make it this, you know, this enormous project that, that's in the back of your head where you just keep putting it off and, and putting it off. And so it sounds like even just a, a great process would be having a spreadsheet, right? Where you can actually just jot down who, who you're talking to and where they came from and maybe even chopping up your, your process of what you're probably doing already, but formalize it and put it into these steps. And I think that get, kind of gives you the groundwork for, okay, I need to you know follow this, this methodical process. And that, that will probably lead to the innovation of you know, the checklists and the, you know, the different percentages that, you know, the KPIs that you're talking about. But um, totally. I, I think it's, you know, like with a lot of things like this, it's, you know, the biggest thing is just getting started. And yeah. um, it, it seems like, you, you know, getting a software or something where a lot of that stuff's already kind of baked in is probably a great way to, uh, to get going, I would imagine. I mean, I, I think, yeah, I think you you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's you know, it can sound overwhelming because this is something that has taken years um, to perfect. And frankly, like we're always trying to um, make improvements to it. And like our intake system, you know, may need changes now because we're getting more leads than we were getting before. But a really like like one really good way to start is count the number of qualified leads you're getting. 
like just that one number, because if, you know, most firms don't pay attention to stuff like that. So, okay. If you get 50, if you get 50 qualified leads in January and then 60 qualified leads in February and 70 qualified leads in March, that tells you your marketing is working. Right. But in that, but in the, in the converse, if you get 50 in January, you get 30 in February, you get 20 in March, it's going in the wrong direction. Well, how do you know which direction your marketing is going if you're not counting, if you're not even, you know, counting the leads, right? Like just that, and, and that was like the first step we implemented when we had this, you know, Google sheet that we would work off. You know, I would count at the end of the month, I would go through the sheet of all the calls and be like, you know, count one at a time. And then I would look and monitor each month, like is what I'm doing in marketing working? Are these blog posts working? Um, is our SEO company like helping us increase leads? And so just even counting that one baseline number is a, is a great way to, to get started. Well, I hope the numbers look good for you for my own job security sake. But, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, uh, yeah. They've been, yeah, they've been great. I mean, here I am uh, on your podcast. So, you know, that's, that's right. Um, but and you've touched on this a little bit before beyond revenue. What are some of the other benefits that you've noticed from adopting this process, uh, you know, from the beginning? Sure. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of criminal defense law firms, uh, kind of work on volume and that's, it's, it's just, you know, the average case value in criminal defense is going to be much lower, um, than in like family law, for instance, or business litigation or something. Um, so a lot of criminal defense firms kind of have to run and operate off of volume. And one of the biggest complaints I think that clients have with criminal defense lawyers is, you know, people not being responsive or people not mm -hmm. calling you back or, you know, a, a criminal defense lawyer may go out and get somebody's case dismissed and do the greatest legal work, um, it, you know, ever. But if they're not, if they're not communicating with the client on a regular basis and staying in touch with them, the client really has no idea what's going on. And they're just freaking out, wondering and fearing, you know, what's going to happen to them, what's going to happen in their case. And yeah. so when you have a dedicated and systematized process and intake, you are demonstrating to the clients right away that this is a firm that communicates with you, right? Like if, if, if by the time you get to sending the retainer, the intake person has emailed, texted, you know, spoken to them on the phone two times, confirmed the consultation, the attorney's called at the time, scheduled, like you're, you're basically conveying to the potential client, we are a responsive law firm. Like we're not going to be the kind of firm that you pay us a bunch of money and then you're not going to hear from us for two months. You know, um, we're, you know, and, and that, and, you know, I kind of look at these intake processes and I tell this to everyone on my team, like this is the first period with the potential client where we can build trust and demonstrate that we're the type of firm that does what we say we're going to do. So if we say, okay, we're going to call you and follow up on Friday, you know, to see if you have any more questions, you better call on Friday. You know, if we right. say the attorney is going to call you at three o'clock, you better call at three o'clock because that's the first, you know, that's the first opportunity where you could breach their trust. You know, if, if you say, okay, we're going to follow up on Friday and you follow up on Monday, what are you, what are you communicating and demonstrating to the potential client? Well, we don't keep our word, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you can actually send positive messages in the intake process to the potential clients to show them um, what type of law firm you're going to be and how and how responsive you're going to be in handling what, especially in criminal, is like for most people, it's just an incredibly difficult time you know, for, to be in an issue to be dealing with. And you're giving yourself such a intangible advantage over other other attorneys <laughs> that they may be looking at or other ideas of how to go about the situation because um, I think at least in the you know in the marketing world, I think one of the most the number one reason why clients churn is that they no longer feel like you're important. Uh, they're important to us. And, and so I think, you know, I would imagine that you have seen it firsthand where you're being compared to, to other firms, you know, in a, a short window. And just by virtue of you showing that you care, showing that you're, you give them that sense that like, I've got your back. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be the one here that's that's really driving for you and going to advocate for you. That you know, you see, you see people come come your way. I imagine that's a big pillar of of how you guys have succeeded. Yeah, I mean, it. You know, it, it's. I, I think that's absolutely true. And the thing is, um, you you can't be afraid 
to follow up, you know, like, like yeah. you don't know what's going on on the other side. Like, an, like one example would be, um, you know, there are a lot of firms that can get very upset and frustrated if someone doesn't show up for a consultation, right? Well, we yeah. have an entire, like if somebody doesn't show up, we put them into another category called no show follow up. You know, like you don't know if that person went to the hospital. You don't know if that was someone, you know, somebody in that person's family passed away. You don't know what is going on with that person in the per in their personal life. Same thing when they contact you off the web and then you call like right away and they don't answer. Like maybe they weren't quite ready to have the conversation yet. Maybe they were, you know, reading an article or a blog posting or something like that. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to hear from you. You know, that doesn't mean that like, if you, if you're persistent and you keep following up that you might actually get them at the right moment and then be in the right position to help them solve the problem that they have. Yeah. And I've, I hear this a lot when I talk with attorneys about marketing is I'll suggest something and they'll say, well, I don't want to, I don't like that personally. So I don't think my client would like it. And I think that's, you know, you, you've, you've zeroed in on it perfectly that whether it's when you're following up with somebody and just in the normal, you know, business communication process, your own vantage point is often a, you know, the reverse of an asset, right? It's you're, you're, you're letting your own biases come into the picture and you don't know what, what else is going on with that, that person. Right. And so you have this idea that I've already contacted them once this week. If they, you know, if I'm a good attorney, right. if I, you know, if they really want to hire me, then right. I'll just kind of sit back and and wait. And I think, you know, people just kind of have to get over that a little bit. Yeah. And, it, you know, and there's a there's a balance, right? Like you're, you're not, you know, uh, sending them texts at, at three o'clock at night or, you know, something like that. I hope not. But, anyway, not um, <laughs> but, you know, you find that balance, right? And, and, and learn with it. But I think, you know, you, you set that up and kind of be a little bit more aggressive than maybe you, you, you think you should. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, I, I think, I think that's so right on a number of levels. One, look, it's, it's, it's ego. Lawyers have big egos. Like I'm one, I know it. And it's like, you don't want to feel like I'm chasing someone or my firm is chasing someone. If they want us, they'll come to us. I mean, that's fine. But while right. you're, while you have that mentality there, calling up your competitor who's answering the phone directly and, you know, potentially getting, you know, potentially paying way too much or not getting the quality services that your firm might get them. So I look at it like this, like, and I, and I tell this to my staff as well, like our follow-ups are not something we're doing to the clients. It's something we're doing for them. Like we know hundred percent, if this client hires us, they are going to get high quality legal services, high quality customer service, lawyers who are honest with them, lawyers that are going to work hard on their behalf, lawyers that are going to fight for them and advise them to do what's in their best interest. And I can't say that that's every lawyer out there. There are there are lots of great criminal defense lawyers out there who they could end up, you know, hiring or or being represented by that aren't us. But there's lots of ones that aren't, you mm -hmm. know, and we don't know if we're going to get the great ones or they're going to get the not so great ones. But the one way we can be sure that they're going to get quality representation is if they hire us. And so this is something that's for them. This is not something that's even for us, really, you know. Um, and, you know, as far as, you know, yeah, you have to stay within some reason, right? So we might have like a checklist in the retainer sent that says, okay, call and text this day, you know, call, you know, two days later, call whatever time. It's not like so rigid, right? If the client intake calls somebody and they say, right hey, look, you know, I'm waiting to get paid on Friday or I'm still thinking about this, you know, and, and, and we tell them, you know, okay, like you don't have to just follow the checklist like a robot, like take the information you're getting from them, put that in the notes in the software system and then like, you know, send yourself a task or put it on your calendar to like do what they asked for. So if they said, you right. know, follow up with me on Friday and the checklist says, you know, call tomorrow, it's like, don't do what the checklist says, do what your notes say based on your previous conversation form. So it's not like we're, you know, trying to stalk people or something like that. It's just being persistent, understanding that people are busy, understanding that half the time they're not thinking about you. They're dealing with all the things in their lives and we're making it, and we're trying to make it easy for them to hire us by being available and being there and being, um, and, and following up regularly. Perfect. There's a ton of value uh, I took away in this conversation. Um, any chance you might be 
interested in doing like a course at some point to help other lawyers or what? Sure. Yeah. 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 Let's talk because, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, look, I, I love criminal defense and I love, I love practicing law. I also love the business side of things, you know, yeah. like I love getting to work on these issues. I love talking about, um, you know, things that have worked for us. I've benefited a lot. I've worked with consultants. Um, I've worked with coaches and I've benefited a lot from other people's knowledge and experience. And so, you know, there's kind of a saying like you can go out and make a million mistakes and you can learn from all those mistakes, or you can learn from others, people's mistakes and, and move things along faster. So any, any way I can, I can be helpful to folks out there. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Yeah. And what's cool is this, I think has you know relevance for basically every other type of, of law firm. So the, the, the principles and the, the processes aren't really going to change uh, between if it's a family law or uh, divorce, you know, any, anything, immigration, um, there's yeah. still kind of that, that baseline framework. So yeah. um, thanks so much for sharing all this with us. Um, I know it's going to be helpful and um, really appreciate your time um, and everything you provided. So um, thanks so much. And yeah. uh, let's, let's do it again soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick, for having me uh, anytime. Yeah. Take care. All right. Cool, man. Appreciate you. All right.